Hi everyone, welcome and thanks for joining me on today's lecture. Maybe the title made you curious, so this is going to be based on a talk I sometimes give to students, master students or grad students, to warn them about certain dangers in statistics. So I should first warn you that I'm a probabilist mainly, not a statistician, uh, but I do as a probabilist understand the mathematical background of some simple statistical methods and this is all we are going to need today. So this will be statistics 101 level. However, if you need advice on using a particular statistical method, you should consult a specialist and there are many universities who actually employ people to do just that. So what is the difference between a probabilist and a statistician? Well, this cartoon sums it up pretty nicely. So assume you have a pail containing a certain number of beads in different colors. And you make the experiment where you grab a certain number of beads. Now, a probabilist will ask the question, given what is in the pail, how many beads of each color there are, what are the probabilities of different outcomes, of different numbers of beads in your hand? While a statistician will uh, ask the question, given what you find in your hand, what uh, can you say on the number of beads of different colors in the pail? So in a way it is more difficult than doing probability and I do have a lot of admiration for scientists able to do that. Now, the reason why I give this talk to students is that in the last few years there have been quite a few instances of uh, scientists uh, misusing statistics and sometimes causing scandals. For instance, there was this case of a certain pro professor at a well-known prestigious university and he was working on studying nutrition, so how people eat and how, for instance, the size of uh, the plate influences the amount they eat. And you can probably imagine that this is something that is quite likely to be published in newspapers because many people just love this kind of studies, especially if they have weight problems. They like to hear that these problems are not their fault and uh, there may be easy ways to uh, lose weight uh, without any effort. Now, this person was very successful, wrote many articles, they were cited a lot, in some cases they even had an effect on policy. But then uh, trouble started with actually a, a blog entry this scientist wrote where he was kind of bragging about his success in describing his methods and a few statisticians uh, read this uh, blog entry and they said wait a minute this is not a proper way of doing statistics. So they started analyzing some of the papers of this scientist and they found inconsistencies that he was not able to explain. And after a while he had to retract several of these papers correct uh, others and after a few years he finally resigned from his position. Now don't worry, I think he's doing fine, he is writing books or giving talks or something like that, but what we want to, to do here is understand actually what was the, the problem with his way of applying statistics. So here are some excerpts of uh, what uh, these uh, statisticians wrote when they analyzed the paper, so the highlighted parts are, are mine. So they write that at first glance they, they noticed a number of apparent inconsistencies and when they read uh, the papers in more detail they found additional problems. So there were pro problems between sample sizes uh, that were at odds with the uh, number of degrees of freedom, there were lots of statistical inconsistencies in the tests that were used, and in the end they, they found approximately 150 
problems, inconsistencies in these four articles. So what were the, the sins of the scientist? So he actually uh, used two related uh, methods, which are, which are not a proper way of doing statistics, which are called p-hacking and harking. Harking being an acronym for hypothesizing after results are known. So I'm going to explain these uh, problems in more detail. But uh, just the first idea is that they have to do with kind of torturing the data to extract information of them beyond uh, a limit of what you're allowed to do and still do meaningful statistics. And here is a is a, an excellent cartoon by Wendell Munro of the website XKCD, which I'm, I'm sure many of you know. So if you don't know, uh, uh, check it out. So I will come back to this cartoon in, in more details a bit later on. But uh, the basic idea is that here we have the story of a couple of scientists who believe that uh, jelly beans can cause acne. And they do a first analysis and uh, actually uh, the, the results are, are not conclusive. So the p-value, I'm going to talk about it a bit later, is too large to conclude that there's any link between eating jelly beans and having acne. But then they say, well, uh, maybe it is a certain color of jelly beans that causes acne. And you see afterwards you have these uh, 20 panels and at each one they test a certain color. So they test uh, purple jelly beans and brown jelly beans and pink jelly beans and so on. And in all these cases, but one, the test is negative. But there's one case for green jelly beans where actually they find a significant result. And uh, here you see the, the result, which is that the newspaper write that green jelly beans uh, are linked to acne with 95% uh, confidence. So these, uh, these uh, problems of misusing statistics are connected to something called confirmation bias. So in this regard, here's a story I, I like to tell, which is a true story. It's the story of Clever Hans, the horse that was able to perform arithmetic. So uh, it's a horse that lived around the end of 19th, beginning of 20th century. And uh, the horse's master, Wilhelm von Osten, who was a high school teacher in Germany, trained the horse to do mathematical computations. And he would tour all of Germany, going to fairs and so on, to demonstrate how his horse was able to, to do computations. So he would ask the horse uh, questions on uh, so adding numbers, uh, subtracting, but also computing with fract fractions, uh, telling things related to the calendar, like uh, if uh, today is Tuesday is the, is the seventh, uh, what, will, what date will be next uh, week's Wednesday? And uh, the horse would, would uh, answer by uh, stomping the ground with its hooves the correct number of times. So of course people were very uh, impressed by that and many people believed that it was some kind of trick that maybe it was a scam and uh, for a long time no one found uh, any trick there and uh, the, the owner von Austin was actually uh, always insisting that there was no trick he really had taught that horse how to count finally uh, the psychologist uh, Oskar Pfungst made a more detailed investigation and what he did is that he made experiments with different conditions. So in some cases it was von Osten who asked the questions, in other cases it was another person. Uh, sometimes the horse was able to see uh, the person asking the question uh, or in other cases not. 
And also, uh, sometimes the person asking the question was uh, did know the answer and not in other cases. And it turned out that it worked when another person then von Osten asked the question, but it didn't work when the horse did not see the person asking. And it also did not work when uh, the person asking the question did not know the answer. So what Pfungst uh, concluded is that the horse was actually not uh, computing, but it had gotten very good at reading uh, the corporal language of the person asking the question. So what apparently happened is that when, uh, when von Osten trained the horse, the horse would get a reward when uh, giving the right answer. Maybe it would get an, an apple. And being an intelligent animal, the horse would uh, try to do the correct thing to get more apples. And so it got very good at observing tiny unconscious changes in attitude of the person asking. So maybe the person would get more tense when it came close to the right number of times to, to stomp the ground. And this confirmation bias is, uh, is very natural. It's actually very human uh, behavior. It's very widespread. And that's why, you know, all kind of uh, quackpots and conspiracy theorists are impossible to convince otherwise because they really believe in that theory. It's their theory, so they're convinced it has to be right and they are just not uh, receptive to any arguments uh, saying that the theory is wrong and they will use all kinds of logical fallacies to, uh, uh, to uh, prove that their theory is correct. So scientists have been aware of this problem for a long time and they have developed methods to get around this confirmation bias. So one uh, of these methods is to say, well, if you want to prove a certain theory, so you start by formulating a hypothesis, then you design an experiment that should confirm or infirm this hypothesis, then you perform the experiment, and, well, then you look whether the results are compatible with the hypothesis, or maybe if there's some uh, randomness involved if they are likely to be compatible and if not you you have to change your hypothesis. And here is another uh, comic by another excellent website by Jorge Cham, uh, which is a bit a cynical way of describing what is the scientific method and what is the actual method uh, many people use. Now, let me explain in a bit more detail how this hypothesis testing works. And here's a, an example. So let's assume that we want to know whether a certain substance called hydroxychloroquine, and let me call it HCQ for short, uh, is able to cure COVID. There was a person here in France who uh, claimed that to be the case for or why? Well, uh, it turns out that's not true. Uh, but how would you develop, uh, how would you uh, perform a test for that? So that is also something scientists have been developing for many years. So one important thing is that you have to take two groups of patients. So one group gets uh, the medicine and the other one gets a placebo which is uh, uh, something which doesn't have any effect, so sugar pills. And it's also important that the control group, the so, uh, people getting this placebo, are not aware of getting the placebo. So the patients do not know whether they get uh, the medicine or not. And this is to avoid biases uh, which are due to the patient saying, uh, Okay, but I, do, I, I know that uh, what I get is not the, the real uh, medicine, so it is not going to work anyway. 
And then you make a test. So you have these both groups, the group uh, taking the, the medicine and the control group, and you see how many people are cured or not in each group. So here are some figures I made up completely. So it's not from a real study. I just made up some figures to, to give you a simple example. Now, if you look at these figures, a naive thing you could say is to say, well, in the HCQ group, 75% of people are cured, while in the control group, only 62.5% of people are cured. So obviously, uh, the medicine has an effect because more people are cured in the HCQ group. However, let us look at uh, the situation in more detail and uh, let me explain briefly how hypothesis testing works. So first of all, you have to formulate what is called a null hypothesis. And in this case, uh, it's going to be that taking this medicine, HCQ, and being cured are completely independent, which means that there, uh, there's no effect. So the medicine ha is completely ineffective in curing the patient. And then we have to compute what we expect as a result in case the null hypothesis is true. So in my example, I've taken a total number of patients equal to 100 to simplify computations. So, and we had, uh, so if I look here again, so we had 60% of people in the HCQ group and 70% of people in, of all people were cured. So we are going to say that if H0, the null hypothesis is true, the expected number of uh, cured HCQ patient would be the proportion of patient getting HCQ, so that is 60 over 100, times the proportion of people cured, 70 over 100, times the number of patients, 100, and that gives, gives me 42. And I can do the same for, for the other possible combinations. And then I get the following table. So if the null hypothesis is correct, I should get these numbers here, 42, 18, 28, and 12. But of course, in a real experiment, we don't expect to get exactly these results. It's like, you know, you have a coin, you want to know whether it is biased or not, and you uh, throw it a hundred times and you get 52 heads and 48 tails. So then you will not suspect that the, co the coin is biased. Now, if you uh, get 70 heads and 30 tails, then you will suspect that uh, there's something problematic. But where where is the the boundary between, you know, is 55 uh, significant, is 60 significant? So statistics helps you uh, giving answers to these questions. So in this case, okay, you see that the same uh, proportion of each group of, uh, of people are cured. Now here I have put again the two tables, so the actual result of the test and what we would expect ideally if the null hypothesis were true. Now you see the difference is not that large, right? Uh, we have 45 instead of 42, 15 instead of 18, and something one can do in this uh, case is to compute what is called the chi-square distance between the two tables. And there's a formula for that. So what you do is that for each entry, you take the difference between uh, the two numbers here, for instance, 45 and 42 squared, and you divide by uh, the expected number here, 42. 
and you do this in all four cases and you find a certain number 1.7857 so the idea is that ideally you should get zero if the two tables are exactly the same but now you get something which is not exactly zero but is this difference important or not and there's a theorem due to Pearson saying that if H0, the null hypothesis, is true, then this chi-square distance follows approximately something which is called a chi-squared law. Okay, here it is with one degree of freedom because actually if I, uh, once I, I set the, the 45 here, all the other numbers are, are fixed given the margins here. So for larger tables, it would be with more degrees of freedom. And the meaning of approximately here, that is, uh, that is true for very large sample sizes. So the more patients you have, the better uh, the approximation will be. And there are also ways to uh, compute corrections if the sample size is too small. So uh, this chi-squared law is something we have a formula for. And now let us look at what a chi-square test looks like. And there are actually two slightly different ways of doing it, which are equivalent uh, mathematically, but I think there's a difference, there's a psychological difference between them. So the old, the classical way of doing the test is the following. So first you fix a level of significance, uh, let's say 0.05, 5%. So this alpha is the probability of getting a false positive, which means to wrongly reject the null hypothesis if it is true, which is also called an error of type 1. And then you look, out, you look up in a table of chi-square values, what is the probability of this chi-squared distance being larger than uh, 0.05? And okay, you find that uh, this value is 3.84. And we found something like 1.7. So what we say is that it's actually not uh, very unlikely to find uh, such, uh, such a result of 1.7 if uh, the null hypothesis is, uh, is correct. So we say that we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, with these uh, figures I have, we cannot rule out that there is no effect so being cured of COVID is independent of having taken this substance. Now, I told you that there were two ways of doing these tests. And the modern version is, is the following one. So what people typically do nowadays is, OK, again, you fix a level of significance, say 0.05, and then you compute the p-value. So the p-value is uh, the probability under the null hypothesis of getting a value which is at least the one you found, this 1.78, etc. And you see that, okay, this probability is uh, 0.18. So graphically, uh, here I have a plot of the density of my chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. And I look at, uh, so uh, here's the abscissa, 1.7 of chi-square, and the p-value is the, the remaining area here, the yellow area. And here, since the p-value I get is larger than 0.05, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So it's basically exactly the same thing. But 
why am I saying that it has a psychological difference? Well, it is somehow more uh, uh, it it uh, leads people to you know uh, try to change their their data or the way they analyze the data to decrease this p value. And here's a website where people have gathered a list of over 400 euphemisms for uh, what people write in an article when uh, the test fails, when they don't find a significant result. So, okay, they find a p-value uh, of 0 0.08 and they said, okay, there's a certain trend towards significance. Or we had the margin uh, at the edge of significance. There's a moderate trend towards significance and so on. Uh, yeah, an apparent trend for a p-value of 0.286 comma an evident trend. Uh, I, I like uh, these one. It, it approached acceptable levels of statistical significance. It is arguably significant. Now, one thing you have to remember here is that this 0.05, uh, it's what people usually use, but I mean, there's no rule that tells us that it has to be 0.05. And all these articles where people say, okay, we failed this, uh, this uh, chi-square independence test, but we are not so far from, uh, from succeeding, is, uh, as I said, uh, can be a reason to manipulate the data or maybe just change the analysis until uh, one gets a p-value uh, smaller than 0.05. So I told you at the beginning about p-hacking and harking. So here are uh, definitions you find on Wikipedia. So, okay, there are uh, several synonyms for p-hacking. So it's also called data dredging or data phishing or data snooping, data butchery. So that is a misuse of data analysis to find patterns in data that can be presented as statistically significant. And by doing that, you dramatically increase and understate the risk of finding false positive. And typically what happens is that you test multiple hypotheses with a single data set. And remember the correct scientific method was to say, you formulate a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you make the experiment, and then you apply your test. But then you should not change the hypothesis and analyze it again with the same data set. If you change the hypothesis, you should also make a new experiment. And uh, what is harking? So a hypothesis, hypothesizing after the results are known. Uh, that is a related practice where you change, so, so you started with a hypothesis, you made an experiment, it wasn't significant, and then you change the hypothesis, but you present it as if it was your original hypothesis. And again, you increase uh, dramatically the likelihood of getting false positives if you change the hypothesis after you have analyzed the data. Now, let us return to this uh, XKCD comic here. So, remember we had these two people wanting to test whether jelly beans cause acne. First, the first test was not significant, uh, but then they do the test 20 times with 20 different colors. In one case, they find a significant result, and the conclusion they make is that uh, green jelly beans are linked to acne. Well, let's try to understand what the mistake is here. So here the null hypothesis would be that having acne is independent of eating jelly beans. So in the first experiment, uh, scientists would do uh, something like I explained with a control group and uh, a group, uh, you know, uh, getting these, uh, these jelly beans and they 
they make the statistics and they observe a certain chi-square distance and the test is not conclusive, meaning that they find a value of the chi-square distance such that the uh, probability that the chi-squared uh, random variable being larger than this value they find, assuming the null hypothesis is true, is larger than 0.05. So they cannot reject the null hypothesis. Now, what they do is that uh, they repeat the experiment 20 times. And let us recall that this value uh, 3.841, that would be uh, the probability of finding one false positive. So uh, it's, uh, sorry, I, uh, I should say it's the probability, it's the, the value of x of your chi-squared uh, distance such that the probability of observing a larger value of the chi-square distance uh, is 0.05. Now, <clears throat> that is the probability of finding one false positive. But what about repeating the test 20 times? So now the probability of finding no false positive in 20 tests. OK, so for one test, it's 0.95. Now, getting no false positives in 20 tests, uh, the probability of that is 0 0.95 to the power 20, assuming the tests are all independent. So the probability of getting at least one false positive in 20 tests, that's 1 minus this probability, and that's about 0 0.64. So you see what happens here is that the significance level, when we change the number of experiments, has dramatically increased for, from 0.05 to 0.64. So how do you cure this problem? So, well, one thing you can do is that you change your alpha, your level of uh, significance. So you should change it in such a way that 1 minus alpha to the 20 is equal to 0 0.95. And that gives you alpha equal to 0 0.00256. So it means that when doing 20 times uh, the test, actually the p-value uh, you, you have to get to get a significant uh, result is much smaller. And uh, and it also means that you can, can reject the null, the null hypothesis only if the observed chi-square distance is larger than 9.14 instead of 3.84. Now, one remark is that if, uh, okay, alpha is small and the number of tests is not too large, uh, you can act actually approximately get this uh, new alpha just by dividing the old one by 20. And that's called the Bonferroni correction. So uh, let me conclude. So I should say to reassure you, if you are a scientist, it is of course okay to do surveys, experiments first, and then to formulate hypothesis based on these results. That is what we scientists do all the time. What is, however, dangerous is to reuse the same data set from a single experiment and trying all kinds of different statistical tests and testing different hypotheses until you find something significant because of this problem that uh, you increase the probability of getting false positives. And yeah, also you should uh, be aware of the attention from the media. So this is again uh, summarized in a very nice way in this other comic by Jorge Cham from PhD Comics. So that's it for today. Thanks a lot for listening. See you again soon. Bye.